Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how to get from Kafka to Parquet. But before we get started, a little bit about uh, where I'm coming from. So I work for Bold.com, which is the biggest uh, e-commerce uh, platform in the Netherlands and Belgium. It's not Amazon. So uh, we sell a lot of stuff we, uh, from books to toys uh, to, I don't know, we even started selling uh, alcoholic beverages last year, which is uh, pretty cool, in my opinion. Uh, and I'm Gabor. I work there as a data engineer. And previously, I worked in a research institute in Hungary, mostly developing Apache Flink streaming and uh, developing some machine learning algorithms on top of it. And, uh, and then I moved to the Netherlands to, to work at Ball.com. And I was in the measuring team, and now I'm in recommendations. And today, this talk is going to be about a really simple topic, or at least a seemingly easy task to do. You have a data stream, and you want it to get it into batches, to batch files. And uh, we've tried to do this in several different ways, and we had a lot of struggles. So I'm just going to walk through the solutions, and you will see the struggles, and uh, hopefully you, you can learn, learn from it. It's actually a pretty old, uh, old or kind of old topic. We did this uh, one, one year, one and a half year ago. But I think the value is actually learning from uh, what problems you can face when you're, uh, when you're doing this. Uh, and you can learn a lot about the underlying systems if you look at this problem. So what do we start with? What's the actual problem? We have a Kafka match issue, and we have click data streams, so users clicking around, uh, visiting some uh, pages. And all that data is stored in Kafka. Why in Kafka? Why do we need a, a yeah, I, how many of you know, know Kafka? OK, yeah, and I don't need to talk about it. So of course. We have a lot of events. We have around uh, 10,000 events per second uh, at peak. So we need a scalable solution. We need a distributed messaging queue. So that's why we store it in Kafka. And we, we just want to get these events into immutable files on HDFS. Can I, can I say HDFS still? Because it's, is, it, is it outdated? Yeah, you can, you can, you can say buckets as well. It's, it's, it's practically the same problem. Uh, but uh, in our case, we used HDFS uh, for this one. So uh, the question is, how do we do this? This sounds simple. But before, before I get into it, I want to make the distinction between batch and stream processing. And that's also probably you already know this, and this seems pretty basic, but there's a real nice metaphor I like sharing, which is for me, batch processing is a bit like you have buckets of water, and you want to fill up with a, a pool with water, and you just uh, bring buckets of water from a water tap and fill it in the pool. So you go several rounds there and back to the tap and between the pool, and slowly you fill up the pool, and then that's, that's the batch processing. Whereas in stream processing, you just have a water hose, and you just hold it, and the pool gets filled up with water. So that sounds uh, cool, and uh, the little child is really happy about it. Uh, so what is our problem in terms of this? So we actually want to allow uh, batch processing. We want batch files. Uh, why? Uh, because a lot of people, data scientists, data analysts, uh, are, cannot use Kafka directly because there are tools that cannot read easily from Kafka, and batch processing for them is the way to go. So uh, we need to t uh, turn our systems into buckets. And it's basically you have the fi fire, uh, water hose, you have the streaming data, and you want to put it into buckets. So this is the expectation. It should be easy. Just fill up, fill up the buckets. But the reality can be a bit crazier, and that's what we experienced. And yeah, I only have cute dog pictures. Uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Holden's talk yesterday. She, uh, she had uh, cat pictures. I like cats more, but dogs are also cute. So here you go. So why, why, why was it hard? Because it's not just like you want to, want to have these files from the Kafka queue, but you have additional requirements, uh, or at least we had. And one is, of course, we need a scalable solution. I don't need to explain this. This is a big data conference. So we had a lot of data. We need something uh, that scales. Uh, we also want exactly one semantics. What do I mean by that? So I have events in Kafka. Uh, and I don't want the same event to appear twice in our files. Because uh, let's say Casey. Casey is a data analyst at her company. Katie doesn't like when she tries reading the data first, she doesn't like saying distinct every time when she reads the data because uh, 
we should think about our data consumers first, and uh, that's why you need the exact ones. Another topic is we want the files in event time. Uh, what do I mean by that? If I have an event that arrived at, uh, at, uh, at 11 uh, p.m., but the event, was actually, the event actually happened at 7 p.m., I want it to be put in the bucket of 7 p.m. Uh, why? Because Casey doesn't want to deal with this either. The data consumers don't, don't want to deal with late events. They want to know what happened on that, in that hour and not what the, the events arrived. Uh, and we want columnar format, uh, which is better for reading. And I will get uh, a bit more into it, uh, why it is better for reading. So columnar format like Parquet, is if you have like, a, like, have like a simple data set, when you have events like uh, this customer visited this product uh, within this category, uh, you can store it in two, two different ways uh, on disk. One is if you use a row-oriented format, on the disk you will sto store uh, the rows one by one. So, so you first store the customer ID, uh, the visited product, and the product category for the first row, and then for the second, and so on. And in contrast, in a column-oriented format, it's not going to be a surprise. You first store all the customer IDs, and then all the visited products, and then all the uh, product categories. And why is it better for, for reading and analytics? Uh, well, you get a lot, of, lot from it, but one of the main advantages is, like, let's say, Peter is also a data analyst, and, and he doesn't care about the product category. He's only interested about the customer ID and the visited product within the events. If you're using a row-oriented format, then he will need to read all, all the data in even the product category. Even though he doesn't need the product category, it will take a lot of time to load in the data set for processing. Whereas in column-oriented format, because the data is stored in columns, we can just get rid of the category column at reading and uh, use the, the columns. So both Casey and Peter love this. Uh, uh, column-oriented format, even they, if they don't know what Parquet is. And, uh, of course, Parquet is one example for a column-oriented format on disk. We've seen another talk yesterday about ORC, ORC which is another uh, example of a, of a column-oriented format. They are similar in a lot of ways. I won't get into the details. So that's about uh, Parquet. But, like, you could also ask the questions, like, uh, these are the advantages of, of Parquet, but why not use something else? Uh, why not use, if you ask the question, why not use CSVs or plain text, maybe, then please attend uh, Niels Bashes' talk, and he's going to talk about uh, how, to, how to evolve your schema in streaming applications. Uh, uh, and, and I hope he's going to convince you that it's not wise to use uh, plain text, and CSV, and, and JSON. So I re really recommend that talk. But let's get back to our requirements. So we have all these requirements. We need a system or something, a tool that solves our problem, and we can load the data in. So what did we pick? My first candidate was Apache Flink. Why? Because first, I already used Flink. And it, it kind of promises to deliver on every aspect. It's, a, it's scalable by nature, because it's a distributed processing system. And uh, it gives you exactly one's guarantees. It has uh, semantics for event time, windowing, and it has an output format to Parquet. So if I'm just using Flink, probably it should work out of the box. I don't need to have any trouble. Yeah. Uh, so that should be our solution. Well, let's start with the first one, then uh, the windowing, uh, how to do, do that in Flink. So first, you have the stream of data, and I simplified this a bit. Uh, I, I, I drew there, drew there uh, the Kafka queue, and those little squares should be messages within it. Of course, you have multiple partitions, but it's generally the same, and it's easier to explain with just one partition. So you have that data in Kafka, all those messages. And with windowing, what happens uh, is Flink uh, takes the data in, and you, I, I just separated the two events. Let's say we, we take uh, buckets of one hour each. So uh, there's, a, there's a bucket or a file between 18 and 19 hour and between 19 and 20 hour, uh, the blue ones and the brown ones. So what happens with windowing is 
it's pretty simple. Think takes in uh, the data stores stores uh, these events into memory into two separate uh, windows, and then uh, yeah, and then whenever there's a point when we saw that there there will be no events between 18 and 19 hours, we will write the files, and uh, and that's it. So it sounds good, but what happens when failures uh, happen? What, what do we do? So, of course, failures do happen because uh, when we, uh, at our, at our on-premise uh, Hadoop cluster, uh, nodes uh, get down for maintenance, so failures will happen to we need to account for them. Uh, that's really nice. Uh, Flink will handle the failures uh, out of the box. If we're using their windowing API, it's just going to work. So that's good, but there's always a but. Uh, why did we have problems with this solution? So the problem was that it was using too much memory. Like I said, Flink basically stores these windows in memory. Uh, so when the data load increases, it will just, uh, uh, it could go out of memory or you need to uh, scale your uh, uh, cluster up uh, to account for that. So for instance, if you have a cluster for the previous use case, uh, storing buckets in one hour, but you change your mind and you want to store it two hours instead, then it will just take the data in and in and broom out of memory or yeah, or you will need to increase the memory. But anyway, it's, uh, it happened uh, quite often. So, and it also kind of feels bad, like we are just writing data from one disk to another, writing from Kafka to, to files. Why do you want to st we store a lot of data in memory, in expensive memory to, to just uh, solve this? So we went on to another solution, which is called something called a bucketing sync in Flink. And that promises to write data into bucket files uh, based on time. So so-called buckets, just like in, in my example, uh, the data is not stored in memory anymore, but Flink will account for different files in, in memory. So let's see how that works. Data comes in and it gets sorted into these buckets. Uh, so there's nothing in memory, nothing in Flink. It will write it directly uh, to the files. But how do we handle failures in this case? So first we need to know one thing about uh, Flink uh, fault tolerance, and then that's, that's the point when you already need to understand the system for a seemingly simple problem, because you need to understand the fault tolerance. So Flink uh, does it, its fault tolerance by having so-called checkpoints and uh, barriers. And there's a point in time or a point in the Kafka message queue when there's a checkpoint barrier. I mark it with, with that green line. And when we get to that barrier, a checkpoint happens of the current state of writing. And uh, Flink also marks the number of bytes written to those files. So we know where we left off uh, with the writing. and. Uh, and then it goes on, and we still have that green mark. And when a failure actually happens and a node goes down, Flink just goes back uh, in the Kafka queue in reading. Kafka is good because you can just move with, uh, move with offsets. And uh, it will get rid of the part of the file that, that was written after the checkpoint. So that, that's the way it can gar guarantee exactly once the writing, because we get rid of the partially written data, we, we won't get any duplicates. So far, so good, uh, but uh, there's a problem with this. Uh, truncating is not really supported on HDFS, and uh, actually uh, the Flink community fixed this, uh, because instead of just marking the point where you left off with the writing in the file, you could just, uh, you could just simply uh, start a new file, and uh, Flink does that. But there's another problem, which is a bit bigger, uh, is that you cannot flush parquet files. And what do I mean by that? So you cannot have a certain point that say like, okay, like I want to partially, I want whatever I have in my writing buffer, I want to put it onto disk and say that, see how many bytes I'm at. And that's probably the, 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 the columnar format why it's not really useful to have this flushing capability. So, so we just couldn't use this. So we had to do another solution, which, which is we decided to just uh, close the files at every checkpoint, which is already uh, a bit tricky. So same scenario, we get the data from Kafka, and whenever a checkpoint happens, 
we just open another file. And like I, uh, like I said, this is already supported uh, by Flink. Uh, but when, back then, when we were doing it, it wasn't supported uh, in, in those Flink versions. So we needed to, to do it ourselves. And in this case, after the checkpoint, a new file starts. We go on with the writing. And when a fa failure happens, we don't need to truncate on anything. We could just get rid of the old files and, uh, and start ahead. So that sounds good. But the problem is that first we needed to hack this in into the Flink bucketing sync code. So we all already needed to modify the Flink code somewhat. Like I said, this is or not, not a problem anymore because it works out of the box from uh, Flink. And that's something uh, uh, that's really nice in these open source communities that you have a problem. And half a year later, it's already fixed uh, uh, within the open source software. But we have another problem. The, the number of files is determined or really tied together with the checkpoints. So if we have really fast checkpoints, then we will have a lot of, lot of small files uh, on HDFS, and that's bad. And as far as I know, it's not really nice to have a lot of small files in, in cloud uh, storage and cloud buckets either. So, so we didn't like it especially, because when we were handling late events, uh, and we'd, we'd say that we have, we would need buckets of one hours, and we have we want to account for late events that happen 12 hours later. If just one event comes in like every hour later, then we would have like files that only have one event, which is a big overhead in a in a parquet file. So, at this point. I, w I was already like, and we, our team was already like, like this streaming full tolerance and all these things. Why? This is just a simple problem. I want my data in batches. Why is it so complicated? So actually, one a teammate of mine had an idea that uh, let's just do let's just do batch processing because then we don't need to care about the full tolerance. So we so we did that as a as a prototype, and uh, you can imagine an early batch job, which is just like really simple. Let's just take in all. Let's just go through all the data in the Kafka queue, and and just put out the hour we are interested in. So first we we'll go through the queue and put out the, the events between 18 and 19 hour, and then when that job that that job is finished, we can go through the events, uh, go through the same data, and only output the events between 19 and 20 hour. And of course that's 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 easy in the sense that you don't need to deal with any streaming fault tolerance. So maybe carrying those buckets uh, can be fun together with uh, friends, and sticking to batch processing could be fun. But like, yeah, you could say that, of course, this is not perfect, because we, we are reprocessing a lot of data. We are reading the whole Kafka queue. That's, uh, that's also a waste of resources. But, uh, and, and also, because it's batch processing the data, it's not supporting the so-called, what I call the semi-real-time use case when you have a data scientist or data analytics people that want like data that's like 10 minutes old in files so they don't really want really really low latency real time data from kafka and i think that's a typical use case as i'm in the recommendations team uh, now i i do want data like that uh, but data that's that's refreshed every 5 minutes or every 10 minutes something like that and if you're doing this kind of batch processing from kafka to files then this use case is not supported. And this is a bigger problem. Of course, you could do optimization for this. Like, you don't need to read all the Kafka queue. Uh, Kafka has uh, an integrated uh, index to index your data based on event time. And then you, can, you, you only need to read the hour that you're interested in. Uh, but we didn't uh, go further with this much. So what's the? What was, what was our conclusion from this? What, what you could ask, what would be a proper solution? Because like, I'm going through all these solutions, but none of, none of them seems the right one. So one thing I could recommend is using database, databases instead of files. And that's what we actually do now. Uh, we, instead of storing the data in files, we, because we use Google Cloud, we store it in BigQuery. And then it could be used for analytics as well. And that's also, in terms of GDPR, that's also uh, 
a good solution in the sense that if you want to delete or modify the data of certain customers, and I mean right to be forgotten or something like that, then in a database it's easier to do than just to process uh, plain uh, batch files, plain parquet files. Uh, so that's our current state. And of course, you could use a different suitable tool. We didn't go into there. For instance, uh, there's Kafka Streams, and maybe because that's integrated with Kafka, that could work better, but uh, we didn't look into that. Or you could try a lot of other solutions. Like I said, in the end, our main problem was that we had a lot of small files. And what you could do is just write those small files, but then later have another job that merges all these small files together. Or uh, m most of our problems are coming from our requirements, of course. So another thing you could do is just, like I said, if you're, if you're waiting for events for 12 hours, because one, we want those events, uh, then there's going to be a lot of small files that only have a, f a few events, a few late events. Uh, but you could just say, I don't really care about those, uh, those late events. I, I will only accept uh, events that are five minutes late. So, and another question is, how do we support the real-time use case, the semi-real-time one? Like I said, like to have files like every five minutes or every 10 minutes, and there are different ways to do that. You've probably heard about the Lambda and Kafka, Kafka architecture. So Kafka architecture says like, let's do everything streaming. Let's uh, use just one system to, to, pro, uh, to solve both our real-time and uh, batch use cases. Uh, but f based on these kind of experience, that didn't truly really work for this use case. But you could think about a Lambda architecture when you you first have a, a batch system that processes all the late events uh, in batches uh, from Kafka and accounts for them. And, uh, and you could have another processing or another uh, syncing uh, system that just drops the late events. And then you support the real-time use case, but you also get to keep the 12-hour uh, late events. So, uh, so I think that that could be a better idea for this, this case. And my, the main takeaway I want, want from this talk to, uh, is that this, is, this was just an example, but I think that streaming is pretty cool and the water hose is pretty cool and you could get a lot of value from, uh, from real-time analytics, but what I see is that you could, you, we, could, we could already get a lot of value from batch processing and improve a lot on that. And these stream pro processing systems are not trivial. And I need to say yet, because there's a, a huge progress in there. And uh, like, like I said, a lot of stuff, that, a lot of problems that we had were already fixed uh, by, uh, by the Flink community. So it's developing really fast. So if you're adventurous and you want to suffer a little bit, then, then definitely uh, go with streaming solutions. But uh, then please keep it simple, because once it gets complicated, it, it's really hard to manage. And the other thing that we learned from this is that we need to understand the system, how it works. Because uh, without understanding the system, we, we would probably lose events because we would just say like, yeah, if Flink is a good, good tool, it will just take care of it. It will take care of the late events, the failures, everything. But, uh, but then the fault tolerance didn't work uh, for the bucketing thing, uh, for instance, as expected. So that's it. Uh, you can uh, write an email to me uh, at this pl place. I also wrote a blog post about uh, this issue. And I also recommend, because this is about Kafka, I also recommend this uh, short novel from Kafka uh, to you, which is also The Great Wall of China, which could also be a nice uh, management uh, short novel. You could get ideas from that. Of course, that's just a joke, but still, that's a nice uh, short, uh, short novel. So any questions? Oh, so sorry, sorry, could you use the mic to, because I think this is recorded and then it's... Hi. Uh, did you consider running your uh, near real-time or real-time use cases off of the Kafka queues so you don't write them first? So the, yes, yeah, so, so the problem with that is that, uh, that a lot of tools that our data analyst people use oh. don't support Kafka directly. 
So that's the, that's the initial uh, problem. And then a lot of other systems support uh, Parquet. For instance, we have, we have PIG jobs. And PIG doesn't have a Kafka connector, of course, because, uh, because that's a batch processing uh, system. So. Sure. OK. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, I will stick around. But uh, check out also Neil's talk. That's going to be awesome. Thanks.